Okay, folks, we'll get uh, started on the next talk. Uh, we have uh, a talk by Joel Wittenauer on uh, the future of security in open silicon. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, again, uh, as James said, uh, my name is Joel Wittenauer. Uh, I am uh, the embedded software architect at uh, Rambus Cryptography Research. Uh, the talk is only allotted 40 minutes, and I've got a lot of content, and uh, I want time uh, at the end uh, for questions, so I'm just going to jump right in. So uh, this is uh, my agenda here, uh, which is just to give you a little bit of uh, background in who uh, Rambus Cryptography Research is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow. Uh, we won't talk a lot about it, but uh, because I think everyone's already familiar. Uh, and then I will uh, give an introduction into uh, our uh, crypto manager, Root of Trust uh, core. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the CMRT hardware and software stack. And then we'll finish the talk up to talk a little bit about how all of this can apply to Linux and how uh, Rambus uh, Cryptography Research is looking for some insight from the Linux security community in general uh, to give us some feedback on uh, how uh, this could be used in your particular ecosystems. So, um, so first, uh, how many here, by show of hands, have ever heard of Rambus? So quite a few of you. How many of you know that Rambus has a security division? Not very, not very many. So uh, Rambus purchased uh, cryptography research uh, in 2011, and that was the establishment of the security division. Uh, cryptography research was founded by a fellow by the name of Paul Kotcher. Some of you may be familiar with Paul. Uh, Paul was uh, one of the guys who uh, helped design SSL v3. Uh, in addition to that, Paul uh, wrote the foundational white papers on uh, side channel attacks for uh, uh, hardware uh, for extracting secret keys, uh, particularly DPA, differential power analysis. Uh, that was where uh, crypt uh, cryptography research made their name, was in uh, DPA, uh, extracting keys from smart cards. I think at one time, every smart card that was being manufactured, uh, Paul could extract keys from uh, at one time about, about 20 years ago. Uh, today, uh, Ram, uh, Rambus Cryptography Research still has a strong portfolio in uh, DPA uh, protection. We offer cores, we offer software libraries with DPA resistance. Uh, we have uh, a, an evaluation lab that will evaluate your products. We also have a workstation that uh, you can use to evaluate your own products. Uh, on top of uh, our DPA portfolio, we also have uh, pay TV solutions in hardware. Uh, we have anti-counterfeiting solutions. Um, we also have a uh, mobile payments group uh, in uh, Rotterdam, Netherlands. Uh, we have a, um, a mobile ticketing group in um, East Kilbride, Scotland. Uh, we also have offices in Espo, uh, Finland, in addition to our offices in California. So uh, we actually have a rather large security group uh, that's spread across the globe. Uh, and very few people actually know about it. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we're here, is to kind of introduce ourselves uh, again. Uh, and I believe this is the, the first talk that anybody at Rambus has ever given at a conference quite like this. So anyway. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow. I'm not going to talk much on this slide. I think everybody here knows uh, what the particulars are in this room. Hopefully everyone does. If you don't, uh, I have the related CVEs uh, listed below. In addition to that, if you Google uh, any of these, you'll uh, find the respective uh, websites that have uh, the white papers that describe them. The one thing that I will note is that uh, the Spectre research team included my former boss, Paul Kotcher, uh, who was the CRI founder, uh, and my current colleague, uh, Mike Hamburg, uh, both, of, both of whom were on the Spectre uh, team. I believe Paul also contributed a bit to the Meltdown team. Um, uh, so this is really one is the money quote, I think, uh, that comes from uh, the Spectre Meltdown and now Foreshadow. I actually had to adapt my talk because Foreshadow was so, uh, so recent. Um, <clears throat> Beyond short-term solutions, such as patching, 
the semiconductor industry should seriously consider designing chips that run sensitive cryptographic functions in a physically separate secure core, siloed away from the CPU. This design approach will go a long way in helping prevent vulnerabilities that can be exploited by Meltdown Inspector. And that quote is uh, from Mike Hamburg, uh, who is, uh, uh, again, uh, one of our security researchers that uh, worked on uh, the uh, Meltdown, or rather Spectre. Uh, so we think that uh, Spectre, Meltdown, Foreshadow are just the tip of the iceberg uh, in uh, regards to uh, microarchitectural flaws. Uh, again, flaws that are specifically um, related to uh, optimizations uh, like uh, the vulnerabilities that were exposed by Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow. Uh, you know, scary things are that uh, we can break down kernel user memory isolation, virtualization isolation, um, you know, foreshadow even attacks SGX, uh, which is, uh, we, we, you know, uh, under Spectre and Meltdown, we thought that SGX was still okay. Uh, foreshadow comes along and says no. So we expect that in the future there will be more bugs like this uh, that will be found, again, as scrutiny around microarchitectures increases. So let's talk a little bit about what Rambus Cryptography Research's solution uh, to this, and this goes again back to Mike's maybe somewhat self-serving quote, is our crypto manager root of trust. Uh, so as you see here, uh, on uh, your right-hand side, you have uh, what is like a die shot. Uh, and in there you have the general processing region, uh, which is where your uh, CPU cores uh, uh, would be located. That would be executing uh, Linux, uh, Android, or any other high-level operating system. Uh, next to that, connected over a internal bus, uh, is the secure processing core, uh, which is, uh, in this particular instance, our crypto manager root of trust. The Crypto Manager Root of Trust uh, contains a custom RISC-V CPU that was developed by Rambus, uh, secure memories uh, that include uh, a, a, a dedicated SRAM and dedicated non-volatile memory, uh, crypto accelerators, um, and the, uh, the nice thing is it gives you the flexibility to run custom secure applications inside the CMRT boundary. So, you can develop applications yourself and run inside our secure boundary using uh, the resources available uh, inside the CMRT boundary. Uh, the CMRT also offers strong hardware enforced security, uh, which includes anti-tamper features and other secure logic uh, beyond what's shown here. Some of the uh, use cases uh, that we've identified are listed here. Uh, the ones we think that are uh, most applicable to Linux are uh, secure data storage, uh, secure key storage, authentication, attestation, uh, user data privacy, secure boot, uh, and crypto cryptographic acceleration. Uh, I think all of these are applications that would uh, fit well uh, inside, the, uh, inside the Linux ecosystem. So before I go on any further, uh, since we are again here at a Linux security uh, uh, conference, we, there's some potentially confusing terminology that's used with the CMRT. Uh, so I just wanna make sure I pin that down now because these are terms that I'm gonna be using over and over again throughout the rest of the talk. And again, that could be confusing if we don't explicitly call, call them out. The first is what is a root in res with respect to the CMRT? Uh, the root is not a user. It's not a certificate authority uh, in uh, the world of the CMRT. A root is an entity that is composed of an ID and a permission set for access to CMRT assets. Uh, the, the root defines the security context in which user applications execute. And for a given CMRT, there can be more than one root that is installed. Again, that seems confusing uh, from a Linux context, but we're not talking about a Linux context, we're talking about the CMRT's context. Uh, so you, it allows for what we consider or call multiple roots. So again, I apologize for that terminology, but that is what we use, and that is how we market it. 
Next is the term container. Again, in this particular instance, a container is not related to Docker or other OS level virtualization systems. Uh, in the context of the CMRT, the container is a secure user privilege application, not the environment in which the application executes, but the application itself. Uh, and it's the application that runs under the context of a root that I described in the previous uh, bullet up above. So what's the lesson here with this terminology? The lesson is you don't let hardware engineers name things. Uh, so I, when I got a hold of it, the, the names were there and they stuck and we had to live with it. So, uh, and there's going to be a lot more, again, as I said, uh, these, these are topics that I'm going to bring up the rest of the way through this, uh, through this discussion. So uh, the next uh, topic on the agenda here is to, to uh, go into the uh, uh, CMRT hardware. I think this is probably the most hardware specific talk that I, that's, we've seen up till now. Uh, but I think without discussing and describing the hardware and our design methodologies at Cryptography Research, uh, where we try to build this onion of security from the ground up, so we start with layers of security at the hardware, and eventually when we talk about the software, we'll talk about the layers of security that we have inside the software so that we have defense in depth, just like everybody else talks about. It's our design philosophy. It's something that we truly believe in, something that's actually uh, worked well for us in the past. So uh, we'll, we'll talk, again, start talking about the CMRT hardware and then move into uh, software. So hopefully you can see how it builds upon itself. So what you see uh, over, over here is a block diagram. It's a very simplified block diagram of the CMRT. So it doesn't have all of the blocks, uh, but what I did was I called out the things that I thought were most important in the context of this particular talk. Uh, so what you see here highlighted uh, are two blocks, uh, the CPU and the memory protection unit, or MPU. Uh, again, the uh, CPU is a custom uh, CPU designed by Rambus, and it's specifically designed for the crypto manager root of trust. Uh, it's based on the open source RISC-V instruction set architecture uh, and selected standard extensions of that specification. And what's critical about that is that our CPU uses standard tools. You can download the RISC-V GCC tool set and build code immediately that will run on our platform. Uh, so we are compliant with the RISC-V instruction set architecture, but it has cryptography research uh, additional uh, uh, behaviors uh, that are added in um, to, because again, fundamentally we begin with uh, designing for security, right? Uh, note that uh, our CPU uh, supports uh, the three privilege levels uh, that exist for RISC-V, uh, machine, supervisor, and user, uh, and that will be important later when we talk about the software stack. Uh, we have a me memory protection unit. Uh, it's based loosely on the RISC-V uh, MPU specification, uh, but it's tailored specifically, again, for the CMRT. Uh, we have 24 uh, MPU regions that we can set up. Um, uh, each MPU region is assigned a uh, privilege level, you can't, um, and uh, a uh, access type, either read, write, or execute. Um, the MPU registers can be locked until the next uh, CMRT reset, and why that is important is that when we load machine or supervisor code into RAM, uh, that code should not change throughout that entire boot, uh, and so there's no reason for those regions to either expand or uh, uh, decrease in their size, uh, and they should never change in their access type either. So we lock those in, and nothing, uh, not even machine code, nothing, no hardware, can modify uh, those registers until you, uh, until you reset. Uh, and so that gives us some uh, pretty decent security properties there, I believe. The next uh, important piece uh, to uh, the hardware story is that we have uh, one-time programmable uh, non-volatile memory uh, that is private to the CMRT. Um, writes uh, of uh, zero to one in our sense uh, are permanent. Uh, 
uh, meaning that you cannot go back and rewrite things from a one back to a zero. Um, the OTP stores a CMRT configuration that includes things like the device ID, uh, the current life cycle of the CMRT, uh, and a device unique key uh, is also stored inside the OTP. Uh, one thing to note about the device unique key, it is never exposed on the CPU bus. Uh, it uh, uh, cannot be read directly by the CPU. It's never read by the CPU. Uh, as a matter of fact, when it's created, it's created through a back channel, uh, through a command to the OTP management core uh, during uh, manufacturing personalization. So uh, it's, it's not injected by the CPU. It's done completely in the back uh, through a back channel. Uh, a table of root IDs and permissions. So if you remember back earlier when we were talking ter terminology, we talked about these root IDs and permissions. Those are stored in a table in OTP. Uh, in addition to, the, to uh, those items that are stored in OTP, we also have general purpose non-volatile memory that's available uh, to user containers or user applications. Again, containers or applications. Uh, and uh, the access, uh, access to ranges of the OTP uh, can be uh, restricted by the permissions that are associated to the root. So if you saw earlier, there's permissions, each root has permissions. Part of those permissions can restrict access to the general purpose non-volatile memory. You can either give some or all or none uh, permissions to uh, non-volatile memory for a given container associated to a, with a given root. And we'll get into more about how that works uh, a little bit later. The next really important uh, part of this uh, are the crypto engines. Uh, from our standard offering, uh, we have an AES engine, a SHA-2 engine, and a public key engine, or PKE. Uh, the AES core, uh, we have multiple versions available. So as I earlier I mentioned, we have differential power analysis resistant cores. Uh, we have an AES offering uh, that is, has DPA resistance. Uh, we also have an offering that doesn't, depending on what your uh, size, obviously when we do DPA resistance, the size and gate count increases. Um, similarly, we have a DPA resistant hash core. Uh, same thing with the uh, AES core, it only increases its size when you have DPA resistance. Uh, the public key engine uh, is DPA resistant out the door. Uh, the key sizes that we support for AES are 128 and, and uh, 256 bits. Uh, we don't have enough people who ask for 192 bit, although I guess we could if asked. Uh, we have hardware, direct hardware support for uh, ECB, CBC, uh, CFB, counter mode, Galois, and I think a few others on top of this. Uh, the SHA-2 uh, supports uh, 224, 256, 384, 512. Uh, the public key engine supports RSA uh, uh, standard and RSA Chinese Reindeer Theorem uh, for one, two, three, or four K-sized keys. Um, we also support ECDH, uh, ECDSA uh, for the NIST curves like P256, 384, 521. Uh, the ED25519 and other curves are also available uh, with the PKE engine. So the, uh, the next core is uh, another really important one is the key derivation core. And it's responsible for deriving and managing keys. Uh, it uses a NIST compliant key derivation algorithm to derive volatile keys from base keys. So if you remember earlier I mentioned in the OTP we store a device unique key in OTP, which is not exposed to the CPU, that key can be delivered securely again without the CPU seeing it directly to the KDC, the key derivation core, uh, and you can uh, use that to generate uh, volatile keys, uh, the, the same key over and over again, but it's volatile in that you don't store it anyway, so anywhere. So that's, I think actually a really good property is you don't have to store these keys anywhere. You have one base key that is stored in secure OTP. You can generate these keys on the fly. It's the same key every time. The other thing that's nice is that the part of the key derivation path where you derive the key uh, is dependent upon what root, the context, the security context under which you're running. So one root cannot create the same keys as another root, except for collisions, which are pretty rare, right? But um, so that's actually uh, where, where the security, con part of the security context comes from is that one root can create a, an entire fleet of keys and another root can create another fleet of keys and the two shall never meet, which is really nice, a great property. Um, 
Again, it operates independent of the CPU and can deliver keys to the harbor core. So if you want to create a key and deliver it directly to the AES engine, uh, that's supported. Um, similarly, for the hash core, you can deliver keys directly to the hash core uh, to do uh, HMAC operations. Other important cores uh, that I think um, are interesting, even uh, for, uh, specifically for uh, uh, your ecosystem, are uh, the key transport core, which manages key interfaces outside the CMRT boundary. So you can use the key derivation core and your device unique base key to create a key, and then you can export that key to another hardware block that you have. So if you have a proprietary hardware block that does some particular crypto function, uh, if you want us to manage that key and deliver that key to that crypto block, that's totally supported through this key transport core. We have a NIST compliant TRNG and a DRBG. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's actually it should be DRBG, I apologize. Uh, and then uh, we also have a DMA controller uh, that allows for uh, fast movement of bulk data to and from SRAM, our internal SRAM, uh, crypto cores, uh, external memory, et cetera. So that gives you some uh, extra speed boost uh, for doing some of these algorithms. Okay, so the, uh, the next topic uh, is uh, CMRT software. So hopefully you saw from uh, the previous slides when we talked about the hardware where we kind of from the ground, the CPU and MPU, we try and build up the security of the system, uh, secure uh, non-volatile memory. Um, we're going to try to do the same thing with the software stack as well where we start from the ground up, uh, build security from the ground up. So the software stack, uh, so what you see over here on, uh, on over here is a, again, simplified diagram of the software stack, what uh, components are available. Uh, and uh, again, we have uh, support for three privilege levels of execution, uh, and we utilize all three, uh, not only during boot, but also uh, during runtime, we utilize all three. Um, so in user space, uh, obviously the containers uh, are executing in user space. Uh, in supervisor, we have an operating system. We use the Zephyr operating system. Uh, and uh, we also have related hardware drivers uh, that are inside uh, the supervisor privilege. And then in machine, uh, we have our most security sensitive code that executes in the machine privilege. Uh, and we also have our internal secure, secure boot. So the code that is responsible for securely booting the CMRT um, is, uh, is located in machine privilege as well. So the first uh, component to call out here uh, that's located in the machine privilege uh, is our first stage bootloader. It's uh, located in read-only memory, uh, so it's, it's immutable. Uh, it begins the secure boot of our CMRT. Uh, since the uh, first stage bootloader is immutable, uh, a chain of trust is built from that read-only memory uh, through images that we have stored in OTP and in flash. Uh, the, st the image that we have stored in OTP is primarily to augment the behavior of the first stage bootloader, uh, which is again in ROM, uh, which is typically not built for a particular platform. Any platform specific extensions are just put into OTP and uh, again, augment the behavior of, uh, of the first stage bootloader. And again, since it's an OTP, it's immu effectively immutable. Um, uh, so uh, in addition to that, uh, to note here, we have a subset of the system's device drivers that are included with the bootloader. So for instance, if we have to check a uh, ECDSA signature of an image that we're loading from some external flash resource into our RAM, uh, we need a hash core to do the SHA-256 hash, and if it's a PKE, uh, uh, a, a P256 ECDSA signature, then we need our PKE there available as well. So we have, a sub again, a subset of the device drivers uh, that are in the machine privilege as well. So it's funny how uh, we, I, I, I ribbed the uh, hardware engineers about uh, naming things. Well, we have a, something called a security monitor uh, in our software stack, uh, which uh, I believe the Microsoft folks have in their uh, uh, Azure Sphere uh, ecosystem as well. 
Um, our security monitor uh, operates in uh, the machine privilege, and that's where our most security sensitive code is stored, and it's stored typically in a trusted flash image that flashes external to the CMRT. Uh, so we, we will load that image into our RAM at runtime, uh, verify its signature, and then allow it to do its work. Um, so just to give you an idea of one of, the, one of the operations that the security monitor manages for us is that when a user container is loaded by the CMRT and the supervisor actually manages the loading for us, then the supervisor makes a request up to the security monitor to verify one, what root owns this user, what context under which will this, what root context under which will this uh, container actually execute. Um, and we'll get into how, that, how, that, how that's managed here shortly, but uh, it does a lookup into the OTP uh, to, to verify that, that this container actually belongs inside this particular CMRT. Uh, next, it verifies the digital signature of the container code, you know, it hashes the code and then verifies that signature uh, using the PKE. Uh, it verifies the permissions, so each container can request certain permissions. Uh, those permissions, though, must be a, uh, a subset or less than or equal to the uh, permissions that are stored in the OTP table for that particular route. And then it applies hardware permissions to respective cores. So software, software doesn't actually manage most of the permissions. We do have some software permissions. Uh, but most of the permissions are actually managed by hardware themselves. So if you remember earlier when I mentioned that uh, you can restrict address access to um, OTP, that's actually managed by the OTP management controller itself, not by software. We, we, we load in what address ranges are uh, acceptable, uh, what uh, fixed areas, such as like lifecycle, does this container have access to lifecycle, does this container have access to device ID, uh, those kinds of things are all part of the permissions model and hardware enforced permissions, not software enforced permissions. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's an important point to make here. Uh, the other thing that uh, the security monitor does is it also handles uh, root management. Uh, what that means is uh, if in the field you want to create a new root for some other application to be able to execute inside the CMRT, uh, if the container that's executing actually has permissions to do so, you can create that new root and add another root to the OTP table. Uh, if you want to delete a root, you actually can't delete it because it's an OTP, but you can obliterate that root by effectively just writing all of the zeros to ones and that, that root is then invalidated at that, at, that, at that point. And that code is then, again, as I said, managed here in the security monitor. So uh, at the supervisor operating system layer uh, where, uh, is where we have a modified version of the Zephyr operating system. Uh, it uh, supports application loading. So, it, it, so we have the operating system, which is effectively in SRAM. You can load at runtime. You can request a loading of a container at runtime, which is our application. So we have a, uh, a runtime application loader uh, that's available, uh, that's a part of uh, the supervisor image. Uh, we have complete kernel user memory separation, uh, which is, uh, wasn't available on RISC-V when we started this project. I'm not sure if it's available yet on the main line. Um, we have a, uh, a Unix, Linux-like device driver interface with open, close, ioctal, um, now all of our modifications are controlled by kconfig and uh, most of these will eventually be upstreamed. Uh, I believe, uh, I'm not sure what the timetable is for our upstreaming, um, but you can, you can talk to us later uh, about, uh, about our plans for that. Um, the, uh, the other features of the operating system are that it provides a container's access to hardware core, so user containers have no access to hardware, they're effectively sandboxed in a way that they do not have access to any hardware at all, and all access must go through these device driver interfaces. Um, so again, you use open, close, and IO, IO control uh, to get access to, if you wanna do AES, you have to open up an instance to the AES device driver, uh, and then you use uh, IO control, read, write, and other uh, system calls effectively uh, to, uh, to gain access to the AES hardware. 
Um, the other thing is uh, the operating system here uh, is also the first line of permissions enforcement. So on the previous slide I mentioned that uh, hardware uh, is our backstop for all permissions enforcement. But we also do checks here. So if you're really not allowed to access a particular region of OTP, for example, we'll stop you here. But if for some reason that check fails, we always have the hardware as a backstop. So we do, we do it here, and then we also do it uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the hardware as well. The, uh, the last bit of uh, the um, software stack here are uh, the containers. Again, our containers are customer-developed applications. Um, so they would be developed by anyone here in this room who's capable of writing a C program. Uh, it's just straight uh, C. Um, we have um, um, libraries that, that are mentioned here uh, that are available as well to help in the development of these applications. Uh, each container is signed with a private key that is associated with a specific root. In the next slide, I'll get into the details of how containers are actually built and created. But just know that they have to be signed uh, and that the, the key that is used to sign it is actually somehow attached to a specific root. Again, that root must be found inside the OTP table. Uh, containers have associated permissions that control access to keys and hardware resources. Uh, permissions are also limited in hardware to those available to the root associated with the container. So again, you have root permissions and then you have container permissions. The container has a subset of its root. Uh, it has a subset permission of permissions for its particular root. If, for example, if it requests an area of OTP that is not associated with its root, so its root does not have permissions to access that area, that container will be rejected. It's actually rejected and we wipe it out of SRAM. Um, you're not allowed to, uh, to request uh, assets that your root does not have. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, the libraries here uh, that are attached to the container. Uh, we have a C runtime, gives you your mem copy, uh, mem set. Um, and we also have a global platform TE compliant crypto library. So as I mentioned earlier, if you want to get access to the AES hardware, you can do the open uh, and then the IO controls, et cetera. Or uh, we do all of that work for you. We wrap those uh, in a, uh, again, a, a GPTE compliant crypto library that's available to, a, to developers who are writing uh, container applications. So uh, this is a very busy uh, diagram. Uh, it's going to get busier here. Um, but the, the first thing is, well, where does all of this come from? I mean, where do root permissions come from? Why, how, do you, how do you associate those things? So typically, uh, root permissions uh, start with the, uh, the SOC manufacturer. So you know, CM, the CMRT is uh, embedded in a system on a chip. Uh, that system on a chip manufacturer probably created a root during manufacturing and sets up the initial permissions. Um, if you have an agreement with that SOC manufacturer, they may also program your route with your associated permissions. Uh, your associated permissions are probably uh, uh, something that you would uh, work with the SOC manufacturer. And if you're the SOC manufacturer, of course, you can do whatever you want. Um, so that's where the root permissions come from. They're just, it's just a file that describes what access this particular route will have. And any container that runs in the context of this route will, ha will adapt, adopt those permissions as well, or a subset of those permissions. So how do, we, how do we get this into the part? And how do we create this association? So we have down here a hardware security module that has a public and private key inside of it. And remember I mentioned earlier that a private key is used to sign uh, container images, well, what do you do with the public key? Well, the public key, you export from the HSM, uh, you calculate the SHA-256 fingerprint or hash digest of that uh, public key, you attach that to the permissions and program it to the OTP. And that's how a root is founded inside the CMRT. Uh, again, this typically occurs during uh, manufacturing personalization. As I mentioned earlier, if you have a container that has the proper permissions, that containers later in life can also create new routes and program those routes through the exact same process. Okay? So how do you build a container? Well, again, it's just, it's C code. Uh, so, and you, we, you just use a RISC-V compiler 
to compile that into a uh, binary uh, where your text and data is located here on uh, the right-hand side of the diagram here. Uh, so you have just your raw binary sitting here. Um, you take the roots permissions and then you determine as the developer, the developer can create a subset of these. Um, uh, although I bet you a bunch of, uh, we'll, we'll just go, I'll just take the root permissions and program them. That's not really good design. Should be using the principle of least privilege uh, to set your container permissions to what this code is actually doing. Uh, so if you don't need access to OTP, then you should say in here, no access to OTP. Um, so you build, the, you build your container binary, you attach to it a container ID and the request of permissions that you did through here. We take this entire object, send it over to our hardware security module, we hash it, we sign it with this private key, and then we attach the signature, the resulting signature here, and this public key to create the entire container image. So the container again, image again has the binary, an ID, the request of permissions, a signature of everything above here, and we attach the public key to the image. And now that is a container image. So now what do you do? I don't know. Let's see. So now you can uh, load this entire image into uh, the uh, SRAM of the CMRT. Uh, we have mechanisms that uh, facilitate that process. Um, so you load this into SRAM, and at this point, as I mentioned earlier, the security monitor uh, first determines uh, if this container's public key matches an existing root. Uh, so again, we just do a SHA-256 of this, th this, what's attached to this blob here. We take the SHA-256 of this object here. We look in the OTP. Does it match any ID, any resulting ID? If not, we kick the thing out. Uh, if it does, then we go further. Uh, so the next step is now we're going to do the hash SHA-256 of this information here. We're going to use this public key, the signature, and the hash of this information. We'll validate that signature. Uh, if that's good, we go on to the next. We evaluate the uh, permissions, the requested permissions. We've now validated that they were signed by a trusted entity, right? So now we can, now we can check to see, are the requ requested permissions within the bounds of this root, again, which is, again, stored in OTP. So remember, we programmed this information into OTP. We check to see if it's within bounds. If it's outside the bounds of the request for permissions, we kick it out. If it's inside the bounds, we're going to then apply those permissions to the respective hardware cores, and now your container can execute. Again, if your container requests to do something at runtime that's outside its request of permissions, or obviously the root's permissions, Again, it gets kicked out. So I just wanted to have a slide in here to talk a little bit about why did we select the Zephyr uh, operating system uh, as our, uh, the microkernel that we use inside the CMRT. Uh, the first and most important thing, because I mean, if it didn't exist, we, it wouldn't have even been a part of our selection process. We had several microkernels that we looked at. Uh, it had an existing RISC-V port. If, it didn't have, if, if, if a microkernel didn't have an existing RISC-V port, we, we did, really didn't look at it. Um, the other thing is that it's, uh, it is a Linux Foundation project. Uh, um, and I'm not trying to kiss rear end or anything like that, but uh, it does include a formal governing board, technical steering committee, and a security committee. All of those things actually were really important to us as part of the selection criteria. The other thing is that the Zephyr ecosystem is actually uh, quite nice. Uh, we, were, we were quite impressed by the large active number of contributors. Uh, proper quality assurance and uh, CI were already in place uh, at the time of uh, us selecting Zephyr. Uh, there were great community guidelines and uh, contribution reviews uh, as things were being pulled in. Uh, and one thing to note is uh, a side benefit of using Zephyr is that all of our software is built using the, the flexible Zephyr build system. So our bootloaders, the security monitor image, our operating system kernel, and all containers are actually built using the Zephyr build system. So this, this was actually a huge time saver uh, by, uh, by, by us selecting Zephyr. Uh, so it was actually, a, an, I, I highly recommend it. If you're looking for a microkernel, uh, look uh, closely at Zephyr. Um, so. Okay, 
So why are you all here? You want, okay, uh, it's about Linux applications, right? Um, so on, on all the previous slides, uh, I uh, have been talking about a robust, general purpose, programmable, secure processing environment. Uh, so the CMRT uh, can be obviously integrated into your platform's SOC, but once that's there and once it's integrated into your SOC, what do you do with it? Uh, you know, where do you go with it? Uh, so the following slides are an attempt to answer this question, but really what this is, is I'm, we're Rambus, Rambus Cryptography Research, we're looking for input from the Linux security community at large, any, any uh, applications or anything that you could see for using the CMRT, we're looking for feedback from you, because I mean, we're presenting this as our, our offering to help solve a lot of problems in security, uh, in the wild today, um, and so, but we want some feedback from uh, you folks uh, to try and figure out what we can do further with this. So uh, the first thing to note is uh, we have a, a CMRT a Linux software development kit. Um, the SDK provides a full container development environment. Uh, we have an out of tree reference kernel module implementation. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, we have the uh, RISC-V GCC 7 suite uh, that is a part of our SDK. And we have a QMU emulator uh, for fast container development. Uh, it enables development prior to the hardware being available. Uh, it's easier to use in debug than FPGAs in general. Uh, and the other thing is it's easier to scale your continuous integration environment rather than having a farm of FPGAs that are, that are running your containers that you developed. Uh, you can have just a whole bunch of cores running uh, uh, QMU and executing your containers and getting test results off of that. So uh, that's another great, and actually we, we use that ourselves. Uh, we use the QMU environment ourselves for a substantial amount of our CI. Uh, we also have FPGAs that, that, that do a lot of work too. Uh, we have a reference implementation available on the Xilinx Zinc 7000 evaluation board. Um, and we have uh, a, uh, a Linux image that runs on the Xilinx Zinc 7000. Uh, and then you instantiate the uh, CMRT and the FPGA fabric. And from there you can begin uh, testing out your containers that you've developed um, from there. So some notes about the CMRT device driver that we have. Uh, we have um, the re a reference uh, Linux device driver, which loads and unloads trusted containers for you, uh, provides an interface for user space applications to reach the CMRT. So basically the applications that you have using this reference driver is only limited by your imagination. You can pretty much do anything that you want with it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but you also have to have, make sure that you have available CMRT SRAM for your container that executes. Uh, but one thing to note is that we have mechanisms available to chain CMRT containers together to get around these CMRT so you can have a computation stored away securely so that another container later can pick it up and, and begin using it for, uh, to chain things together. Uh, we have that available. Uh, so here, uh, other things that we're, we're actually actively looking into uh, doing with the CMRT, uh, just, and we're also gauging again if there's any interest uh, in this is uh, creating a Linux crypto engine module, uh, which would be similar to the examples that you find on the Linux tree at Drivers Crypto, uh, requires a general purpose crypto container with a compliant interface that would plug in uh, underneath there. Uh, another thing that we're, we're, we're actively looking into right now is trusted platform module emu emulation, either 1.2 or 2.0, uh, which again would be similar to the examples that you find in uh, Drivers Char TPM. Uh, it, reduces the need for an extra part on the PCB. So I think this, is a, this, this actually excites me more than anything, is that if we could reduce and get rid of a, a part on the PCB and traces on the PCB uh, and, and uh, alleviate that area and move it into the SOC inside our core, I think that's actually a, a, an, an interesting use case. Again, it requires a container that exposes the uh, TPM interface. Uh, and again, these are things that we're looking at, but we're looking for feedback from you folks to see whether or not these are, these are things that would actually excite you or interest you or interest you enough to, uh, to integrate the CMRT on your particular platform. Okay, I don't know if I have any time left or not. A little over time. Huh? We're over time. Out of time? Okay. So, if, yeah, if you have any questions. Um, okay, one question. One question, okay. Thanks for your talk. So you provide the um, hardware solution, and do you have 
defenses against physical attacks like various kinds of glitches and so on? Yes, actually. Um, and if, if we can talk about that after. Uh, it's, it's pretty involved. Uh, but you, uh, and if anybody else is interested, we can talk. But and, and small question: Does your board provide JTAG um, yes. interface? Yes. Yes. And do you provide it in your um, production? Uh, yes, and product? and it's also just you can also disable the JTAG as well, and then That's securely re-enable it later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Here's my contact information, um, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk here. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Joel.